Welcome to Pittsburgh Earth Day's The Dirt Podcast, featuring Grant Irvin, live from the Point Park University Center for Media Innovation. Here is your host, Grant Irvin. Hello and welcome to The Dirt Podcast. I'm your host, Grant Irvin, Chief Resilience Officer of the City of Pittsburgh, and here to give you all the dirt on the lowdown on sustainability across Pittsburgh. We're coming to you from the Center for Media Innovation at Point Park University. We want to thank them up front uh, for giving us the space and the fabulous recording facilities. And today we're here with Ned Eldridge, President and CEO of eLoop LLC, an IT and sustainability specialist based here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ned, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Grant. Thanks for having me on the show. It's really, really wonderful to uh, have uh, one of our great business leaders here from the Pittsburgh region, um, specifically one kind of advancing sustainability both within their organization as well as across the region. Um, you know, Ned, let's, let's jump into the conversation. Maybe give a little bit of background first about yourself um, and kind of, you know, your career trajectory and how you came to becoming the CEO of eLoop. Okay. Uh, wonderful. Um, I actually grew up in State College, Pennsylvania, in and around all the mountains and hung out in the streams and really enjoyed uh, the rural atmosphere. Um, in my sophomore year at Penn State, I met a woman from Penn Hills, Nancy Fennell, and uh, I got here to Pittsburgh a year ahead of her in 1979. She graduated in 80, and uh, we got married in 1981 had three wonderful children who are now off on their own. Uh, one lives in Annapolis, Maryland, one lives in Pottstown, PA, and the other one is in law school up in Brooklyn. Um, you know, the, the whole involvement of moving to Pittsburgh from State College was wonderful because when I showed up, we were the city of champions. Mm -hmm. At that point, I had gone through uh, a succession of working as a social worker and then worked as a banker I ended up getting an advanced degree from the CAT school at Pitt and became, got my MBA, and then I got into my first entrepreneurial venture. Well, which, before I let you go there, tell us, I mean, the Pitt-Penn State connection there, that's uh, hey, pretty tough, right? Well, you know, it was only tough one weekend a year. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I, I would always root for Penn State, but they're, I'm a, a very strong supporter of the University of Pittsburgh. Terrific. So Absolutely. you have kind of dual alliances. Absolutely. And to add, add to that, my wife has been a nurse at uh, Presbyterian Hospital of UPMC for now over 40 years. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so that so gives you some extra we're... incentive to be in Oakland then. Absolutely. That's great. And so you were saying you led into an entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. I ended up um, working with uh, a gentleman by the name of James Fleming. He had a business in the East Liberty area and it was called Recon, and they were in the automatic transmission parts business. But there was something special about that business because between him and his partner, John Fleming, they had developed a model that allowed us to scale. Mm -hmm. We scaled the business, ended up selling the business in 1998 to a private equity firm, and the key components of the business were a remanufacturing facility. Mm -hmm. So we took transmission parts, remanufactured them into good use parts, and sold them in the open market. That business led me to 2005, where I left there as a, I, I, I owned equity in the business. We were in the process of selling, and I decided to move on and work for Matthews International okay. for about two years. That's I worked for their company. Absolutely, and I worked for IDL Worldwide as their executive vice president and general manager. And during that time, I had an opportunity to get exposure to lean manufacturing, mm -hmm. and we figured out how to uh, reduce the waste in a large organization when they relocated up in the Butler. In 2007, the uh, company, the uh, transmission business had sold, and uh, I walked away with um, a, a decent amount of, of capital, mm -hmm. and uh, at that point, I was um, early 50s, and uh, I retired for a period of about six months trying, <laughs> trying to figure out what I was going to do next. Um, I have one partner that started in the business with me. is a gentleman by the name of Ned Renzi. Mm -hmm. He's uh, uh, one of the partners at Birchmere Venture. And between Ned and I, we uh, kind of scoured the different types of environmental businesses that were out there. Mm -hmm. um, 
we ended up deciding that we ought to try the electronic recycling industry, and I started getting involved in 2008. Um, I can tell you that from 2008 to, to 2021, there have been 13 years of ups and downs. We've uh, definitely learned an awful lot about the industry. Uh, we tried a lot of things that failed, and then we tried a lot of things that didn't fail, and we've ended up in, our, in the situation we're in today. Um, when you really look at the trans or the um, electronic recycling industry, um, it was all about landfill diversion. And if you could imagine, we got our start in dealing with residential waste. We were dealing with all the scrap that comes out of a household, and that would mean your TVs, all your different types of video monitors, your PCs, your printers, and any other electronic devices that had a cord on them. Now, as we got into it, we found commodity markets were available, that we could take this equipment and push it through commodity markets to make sure it didn't end up in a landfill, and it came back into the reuse as all your different metals, steel, aluminum, copper, and all your plastics. As time went on, and we continued to learn more and more about the industry, we found a niche in being able to work with corporations when they're in the middle of refresh programs. Okay. So now you've got corporate entities around Pittsburgh who are planning to replace all of their devices, whether it be laptops, PCs, networking equipment, mm -hmm. servers, et cetera. And then we would end up taking on that equipment and we'd learned how to refurbish and resell it. So that allows you to get it in bulk then? Is oh yeah, we would, we would Basically, we have 26-foot box trucks, 16-foot box trucks, and a tractor trailer. So depending on how big the load was, mm -hmm. we showed up with the right equipment. Okay. Our people would uh, collect that equipment on site, bring it back to our facility, and we would put it through what you call a triage process. Okay. Because if it was valuable and it needed repaired and cleaned up, then we would upcycle it into either a retail or wholesale marketplace. Mm. If it was of low value or broken beyond repair, then we would send it through our recycling channel and turn it back into commodities. Could, could you describe a little bit for us about, uh, uh, you know, the genesis then of, of Elib? Like, what was that initial spark? Like you said, you were working with Ned from Birchbeer Ventures. Mm -hmm. Like, what was the aha moment for you? Where like this is kind of the the space that I think that we can make an impact in. At that point. The competition in uh, the western Pennsylvania area was what I considered to be weak in regard to what needed to be done with the equipment. Okay. Um, there was a, a very well-known expose done by Scott Pelley on 60 Minutes mm -hmm. at that time, and it was called The Wasteland. And this if any— like early to mid-2000? This is 2008. Okay. Fall of 2008, it came out. And what it did is it ex explained and, and showed evidence of how collection, electronic recycling companies in the United States were promoting that they were doing an environmental good. Mm -hmm. And in turn, what they were doing is packaging this material and sending it to the Pacific Rim to be recycled in you know, 19 or 1800 style, okay. where they'd be... Um, cooking mm. in a frying pan that they would use for dinner. They'd Melting be cooking circuit metal. boards to get the metals okay. and all the plastics and everything that was being burned. Okay. And those plastics are full of, of flame retardants, mm -hmm. which are carcinogens. Right. So these people were exposed to environmental hazards right. just to make a day's living. Wow. So the, the impact of that show had a big turn in the on the marketplace because it allowed people to recognize that you had to work with compliant recyclers mm -hmm. to get your material handled properly. So where the spark was for us is we always felt that there was a social good side of this thing. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that you could get products out of the home at that time and then later on out of the business and turn them back into products that can be reused. Mm -hmm. 
and that's where we where we are today. So did you? I mean, good thing that you were watching sixty Minutes that Sunday. Right? Well, yeah, but I can tell you in the industry, once that hit, everybody was looking for it, <laughs> <laughs> and then it aired again. I think six months later in a rerun. What? Uh, so, so you see that spark then, and do you do a scan of the region, or you know, like a, a business plan? What? Was sure. That? Well, you can imagine when we started, uh, there was me. Okay, I held office hours at Panera, okay. and then after I started to get, gravitate towards employees, we used my dining room uh, <laughs> for our conference room. And then by the time we got to 2009, we had created a couple of customers. Okay, uh, Locally, one of the customers that started with us was the Pennsylvania Resource Council. Mm -hmm. And the PRC is very well known in the area for all of the wonderful collection events they hold, whether yep. they be for electronic waste or hard to recycle items. And we've been a customer of theirs ever since. So, uh, or they've been a customer of ours. So we're still the backbone for all of the events they, they handle in Allegheny County. So in some cases you're, you're responsible for maintaining the litter bug then too. Correct, <laughs> correct. Uh, yeah, and it's been a great working relationship. From there, we also started to work with companies like Westinghouse when they were in Monroeville. We started working with Eden Park Eventually, we worked with UPMC, uh, Mine Safety Appliance, Coppers, on and on. So what was that engagement like with uh, uh, finding PRC? Did you have an awareness of their work? Um, and then how did you create kind of the customer relationship with them? When, when I started the business in 2008, I went out and found environmentally conscious groups around Western Pennsylvania, one of them being Sustainable Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So I went down, introduced myself to a gentleman by the name of Matt Mahalik. Yep. And uh, we ended Local up Local setting... sustainability rock star. Exactly. Yep. A great man. And um, he introduced me to the person that was running um, the PRC at that time, which was Dave Mazza. Oh, yeah. And then we had a, an instant uh, relationship that was set up. We carried out our very first collection event over at the... Um, in Lawrenceville mm -hmm. at, I want to say it was the, um, I'm not sure that, I can't re quite remember the name of the facility, but it was, it was small, and a tight parking lot, and we ended up having a box truck there, and we collected like 5,000 pounds of material. Wow. You know, and that was really small when you compare it to what we're doing today. Okay. When you look at an event today that we might hold at the um, Pittsburgh Mills. Okay. We might end up with four tractor trailers leaving there with over 100,000 pounds of material mm -hmm. on an event that ran for four straight hours. Wow. Okay. Now, I don't, I don't want to give – you don't have to give away your secret sauce, but, you know, effectively from what I'm understanding is you have kind of these two intake streams, whether it's like the corporate uh, intake stream or these collection events – what happens next? It's on the box truck, and then where where do you take the product? Well, as soon as the product enters our facility, over the last year, we've implemented a rather sophisticated ERP system. Mm -hmm. So we actually have knowledge of what's coming to us in advance. Okay. When we pick it up, we have a um, basically a handheld device that we can scan all of the boxes that are bringing in. We put a sticker on them, scan the barcode, have the person of authority sign for them. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as that material ends up in our warehouse, it hits our Wi-Fi system, sends a notification back to the client, and that starts our chain of custody. Okay. So then we take that material and we run it through a sorting process. And when we sort it, we sort it out by type of device. Mm -hmm. All the devices end up that we believe we're going to test to resell, they end up getting a asset tag on them. Okay. So we can track it all the way through our testing and auditing program and make sure the quality's good before we resell it. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's a box of cords, wires, different types of things like keyboards and mice that have no resale value, mm -hmm. we're going to tag that as a commodity. It's going to move its way outside of our value area into our recycling area. Okay. And then at that point, when we get a critical load of those devices, we ship them on. So commodities ship out of our facility about uh, twice a month. Okay. Um, and that would be things like uh, your printers, your low-end scrap that you would find in radios and devices that you wouldn't want to throw in a landfill mm -hmm. that end up in what we call our mixed electronic scrap. 
Okay. And then out of that, you're taking uh, metals, plastics, glass, Correct. et cetera? Well, when we're working with a lot of companies, we'll get things like server racks, which okay. are all metal. Oh, that's the... Once we got the wiring out of them and they can't be resold, because mm-hmm. not normally that's not a resale item, then we're breaking them down into the steel. We work with a lot of companies that give us medical devices to tear down, and we end up with a lot of aluminum. Mm -hmm. So we end up with uh, traditionally steel, aluminum, and copper are the metals that we we recycle. Now, when you look at the contents of a circuit board, Mm -hmm. now you have traces of gold, traces of palladium. You have traces of silver, and then you have traces of copper. Okay. So we have to handle that material separately, mm-hmm. and we have a downstream that takes care of the refining of those products for us. And so then you're matching, you have the the intake, you know, I'm trying to match the material mm-hmm. flow, right? You have the intake, you have the separation, and then on the back end of that, you're doing a matchmaking process with regards to those materials that you're able to extract. Exactly. And and we send them the processors who can do the extraction. Okay. We don't own any high-powered shredding equipment to tear that stuff down, so we send it to processors that do. Okay. Now, on the asset side, where we upcycle, mm-hmm. we've got a team of technicians run by a gentleman that formerly was a Best Buy third-level uh, Geek Squad guy. Okay. And uh, he basically helps us make sure we're able to, to – Take those items, put them in the correct funnel Mm -hmm. within our facility to make sure they're either upgraded to a unit that will sell on eBay or they're they're upgraded to a unit that will sell wholesale. What's the wholesale market look like? Well, if you can imagine, we have 120 different wholesale buyers that uh, compete for our products. And what we do is every Monday we circulate a series of logs – that explain what devices are on what pallets or in what boxes. We send them out to the 120 wholesale buyers, Mm -hmm. and they bid on them. So between Monday and Friday, they have an opportunity to bid on our products. Okay. At noon on Friday, we pick the winners, we invoice the winners, and then they either wire us the money or or send us checks, whatever, and we we end up getting paid before we ship them. What's an example of a customer on the back end? Um, There would be a customer um, that's located in um, Mars, PA, where they are a big rebuilder of equipment. So they'll buy items wholesale that might be missing a component. And they can match. And then they turn around and turn them into a retail item that they sell. Interesting. Now, there's also redeployment that goes on today. And this is like another avenue. When you're collecting uh, devices from an entity that no longer needs them, To them, it's kind of like getting rid of your trash. Right. But once we turn them around, refurb them, test them, and get them into a secondary market, they become redeployment items. Mm. So in a situation that was created like COVID, Mm -hmm. where you have very tight supply chains for new equipment, there's a lot of companies that will go out now and buy used equipment because it's been refurbished to a standard that they can easily deploy. Interesting. Uh, you know, I, I want to hold that thought about COVID and ask you that in a, in a second, but maybe before we dive into that, um, can you describe the marketplace? Like, what is the scale of the e-waste market, uh, you know, regionally, nationally, globally? Well, um, I can I can probably speak better to what's going on in the United States. Okay. Um, if you can imagine the cell phone business alone mm-hmm. is a huge $100 billion market. The resale of items like tablets, laptops, PCs, mm-hmm. again, somewhere around 75 to $80 billion wow. of work that's being done out there. And you're talking about just about every region has someone like an e-loop mm-hmm. that's out there providing this level of service. And the reason it's more regional than it is a national mm-hmm. is because of transportation. So it's a logistics game. Right. Hmm. So what what does the e-loops reach look like? Like how far do you kind of extend over, your network? You figure we've been in business for, for 13 years now. We have over 400 customers in the state of Pennsylvania mm-hmm. that count on us to take care of their assets. 
And that's and we corporate travel, as well as like the PRCs uh, well, that's of the world? pretty much the corporate side. Okay. When you look at the residential waste, we've restricted the, the work we do in residential waste to the people we started with. So mm-hmm. the PRC locally, and then up in central Pennsylvania, we have a, a, another e-loop located in State College. Okay. And that services Center County, Clinton County, um, the northern tier counties, Elk County, and we're part of their residential collection network. So you get to visit them on Saturdays in the fall, right? I just happened to get there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can honestly tell you before last year it was a lot more fun. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so, so that gives you, uh, I'm trying to do my math, about like a 200-mile radius here in Pittsburgh. And Easily. And another 200 up around State College or so. Correct. And we have customers in Pennsylvania. A good example would be First Quality. Okay. They're located in Lock Haven. They uh, make all kinds of different types of sanitary and paper products, but they have operations all over the country. So they will end up packaging their equipment and sending it to us via LTL so they can go through one funnel for them. Okay. And it's all handled the same way. Okay. Okay. We have companies even in, in western Pennsylvania like Bear Corporation that we work with, and occasionally they may have us go out of state to New Jersey to collect material for them there. Oh, that's interesting. So then you kind of – once you have that corporate customer, you help follow them in terms of their network. Correct. And where that goes along with them. And and it's one of those things where you can work it out where some companies like you to go and do the deinstallation mm-hmm. and the, the capturing of – of data on site, and then others will pack it up themselves and just ship it to us. Do you do you also operate your own network of trucks and collection equipment? Or oh yeah, as, okay. Yeah, like I said, we have a uh, twenty-six foot box truck, a sixteen foot box truck, and a tractor trailer. Okay. And a second twenty-six foot box truck in the state college area. So the the tractor trailer and and the large box truck stay in state college and run routes adjacent to that area because from state college we can get to new jersey quicker we can get mm-hmm. to harrisburg quicker and we can get to philadelphia quicker so it gives you a kind of a launch pad to yeah. a whole host of other and, markets and the trucks we have in western pennsylvania the two trucks are busy two or three pickups a day all week long and what's the the size of your operation in terms of number of employees and- we have 36 employees okay uh 26 of them are located in export and 10 of them are located in state college okay that's wow that's amazing operation and a quick scale up too in terms of the the trajectory and time that you have from you know the the early beginnings of e loop to today mm-hmm. what uh you know, one of the things that I, I've been really enamored with um, and, you know, done a lot of research and we're doing a, a couple of projects with the University of Pittsburgh and uh, partners at Pennsylvania Resource uh, 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 Center as well as uh, con- uh, Construction Junction and the mm-hmm. uh, and University of Pittsburgh, as I said, um, on the concept of the circular economy. Um, we were talking about this a, a, a few episodes back with Rebecca LaCour from uh, I know Rebecca very well. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I was wondering if you might be able to shine some insights into that in terms of um, you're seeing it, you know, through this component of the supply chain in terms of either upcycling or, mm-hmm. or repurposing and refurbishing. Um, but what are some things that you could see on the design side um, that okay. can help improve uh, the repurposing on the back end of a product's life cycle. Are there are there policies or manufacturing decisions or, or things like that that you you know you as the CEO of, of mm-hmm. Eloop are like God? I wish they would just do this. You know. Like, wow, that's that's <laughs> a loaded question, and, and and I'll tell you why it's a loaded question. Americans, as well as anybody around the world, mm-hmm. really gets excited about electronic gadgets. Yep. Okay, you want to watch the Penguins play Stanley Cup hockey on an HT HD TV, mm-hmm. and if you used to have one that was thirty six inches, this year you want one that's fifty. Right. So what happens is innovation ends up outpacing the useful life of mm. this equipment. So if innovation is moving quickly and people are buying improved items and they're discarding the older items, there's still some use. And value left in them. Right. So we're trying to be the ones that get into that reuse category, which supports the circular economy. Mm-hmm. In, in the probably the best way is when you read and understand how much greenhouse gas is created 
when you're building products, right. you can only imagine how much you're saving by reusing them. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's rather significant. Right. Um, when you look at the IT side of things, uh, we all know that our, our cell phone is more of a computer today than yep. it was, and it fits in your pocket. Mine's a watch right okay. now. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So you've got multiple uses yep. for these things, and they're so slimlined that if it's not broken, you can turn around and resell that. If it is broken and it's an Apple product, you aren't allowed to fix it. Mm. If it's a Samsung product, you can fix it. Okay. But that's where you're going to see a movement towards the right to repair, which is now uh, there's a House bill okay. in Pennsylvania as well as, I think, 14 other states that are talking about the right to repair because mm. once you buy an asset, you ought to be able to repair it. Yep. So when you start saying about, well, what about the design of this equipment? It's designing against people being able to repair it. Wow. So when you, when you look at your laptop today – and you look at your laptop that you had three years ago. Mm-hmm. The laptop three years ago was thicker. Mm-hmm. It had a hard drive in it that you could easily open up the unit and r- remove the hard drive. Right. Today, those hard drives have got so sophisticated, they're a solid state drive that could be embedded in the motherboard. Mm-hmm. And if you owned a product like a tablet yep. or you owned a Surface, a Microsoft Surface, you end up breaking those units to get at the hard drives. That's right, because of the way that they're they're designed, they're in, encapsulated. Exactly, and they're so slim and narrow. Right. There isn't a whole lot of room for error. So there, those so, products like that that are effectively designed for obsolescence. Like correct. Once they break, you have to dispose of them. And, you know, to Apple's credit, they've created their own recycling chain, so they want to try to collect all that material back mm-hmm. and then create the raw materials out of their recycled products and then build more devices. Is that a good thing? Thing. I don't want to put a value judgment on uh, it. I, I, I can't put a value judgment on that either because it's too new. Right. We'll you see. could say it's self creating self-sufficiency. Right. Because one of the challenges that the industry is going to have over time is going to be things like rare earth minerals mm-hmm. and the availability of those as time goes on. You can only imagine if you can recapture them and you could reuse them. Mm-hmm. That would be a, a major plus. Um but the verdict's still out on whether that's the best way to go. What happens with uh, – I remember I was at a workshop one time and uh, just that the exact topic of rare earth metals come up. And the, the topic was about lithium. Mm-hmm. And so like the lithium ion battery and I remember from 10th grade chemistry class. I don't remember too much of that. Although this is the third time I've referenced – this week <laughs> I've referenced my 10th grade chemistry class for different reasons. Uh, but the idea of lithium, it's a rare earth metal. We're not producing – any more of it, right? Mm-hmm. And we can find more, you know, essentially or hopefully. But uh, is is that part of the the opportunity in terms of electronics recycling? Is taking those rare earth metals and then being able to repurpose them? Correct. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be the the best way, best practice mm-hmm. in being able to recycle. What's going to be involved in doing that? There's technology out there. Um, that would say it can be done, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure it's been commercialized yet. It's not commercialized yet. And you look at lithium-ion batteries. There's several companies now that are getting on that bandwagon of being able to take a lithium-ion battery and remove the other chemicals mm-hmm. and just retain the lithium that, so it can be reused. So I would say that that's a market that's going to be available soon. Soon, right. Okay. For us – Lithium-ion batteries are a hazard, Mm. okay, because if they short, they can create a fire. Right. So when you look at how our business evolved, and this is something we didn't mention, there's a high compliance component to this. Okay. So when we got certified as a Ban E steward, and there's really two certifications for our industry, either the Ban E steward or an R2 certification, Mm -hmm. these certifications create the opportunity for a company to get really good at how they recycle. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're downstream. Everybody they ship material to, they have to have really good uh, current information about what they do with the product once they get it. So by vetting all those downstreams, we provide our customer with some assurance 
that things are being recycled properly. Okay. Okay. So that's one of the things that's going on that that people need to know about. the <clears throat> The whole idea that companies are certified, some are, some aren't, ought to be a differentiator in the marketplace. That's interesting. Uh, uh, last episode, uh, we talked with Justine Russo from uh, Pitt Ohio Express. Know her well. And, yeah. uh, you know, Ju- Justine's, you know, on top of it. And one, one of the things that she was mentioning, and it, it kind of leads to this issue, is that the, the chain of accountability mm-hmm. is that more and more companies are trying to not just manage their supply chain, but also manage their value chain through their supply chain. Sure. Um, and and uh, so you're seeing the same thing? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we've been doing this for since uh, 2010. We became certified. Where it's not just taking it off the dock and into your box truck and into your warehouse, mm-hmm. but they want to know or they need to know where that is, where that material is going and how it's being handled. Exactly. What's, uh, you know, one of the, the other terms that's come up, we mentioned circular economy, but another term in this space has been um, extended producer responsibility, mm-hmm. something that's, uh, I know, a big topic in, in the, the European Union right now. Uh, is that something that's coming to America or coming to a place like Pennsylvania? Well, in Pennsylvania, there's a law in the books. It's called the Covered Device Recycling Act. Okay. It's an extended producer responsibility law. That was enacted in 2013, I believe. Um, It has a caveat in there that you can't landfill what they call covered electronic devices, which ends up being your your um, your TVs, Mm -hmm. whether they be old style CRTs or the new LED lights or the 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 LCD type monitors, um, all your computers, all your printers, all your peripherals, Mm -hmm. anything that you would have on your desktop at home, mouse, keyboard, any of that stuff, routers, switches, that kind of stuff, all falls into that category. Well, the program's run by the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So each year they're given a goal. The Pennsylvania DEP is the regulator. Mm -hmm. They collect all the plans from all the manufacturers, and then those manufacturers are responsible for collecting the material in the state of Pennsylvania. Okay. So, for instance, let's say their goal for 2021 is 50 million pounds. That was to be available to every resident in the United or in the state of Pennsylvania, and it's not. Mm-hmm. They were able to get that goal met by just dealing with counties that already had good recycling programs. So for instance, in the state in Western Pennsylvania, the only participant in that program is out in Westmoreland County at the Westmoreland County Cleanways. Okay. If you went to Beaver County, they can't recycle their material for free. Wow. Um, Allegheny County can't, et cetera. So there's an example of an extended producer responsibility law that really didn't serve the public the way it should. Okay. Now, if you look back at others, for instance, paints, carpets, there's there's a whole list of products that mm-hmm. fall under those. Some of those, quote, unquote, hazardous materials. Yeah, but even you wouldn't think about um, a mattress being right. or, or even carpet. But there are laws pending around the country to try to recycle that stuff and just keep it out of a landfill. Mm-hmm. One of the things we've with our partners at Pitt that we've been talking about is uh, – uh, the need to develop a material flow analysis of the region. This gets a little nerdy real quick, but mm-hmm. just because yeah, I figured you'd have some insights in it. Understanding, like, you know, the the amount of material that is coming into the region from consumption standpoint, where we're using it, how we're using it, and then ultimately, like, where we're disposing it. Mm-hmm. Um, that sounds like something you're working with Aurora on. Uh, Aurora's been a part of those conversations. Absolutely. Melissa Billick at, yep. uh, at the Macero Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And and the reason why we're so interested in this, and uh, I've had some conversations with folks at the National Energy Technology Lab just this week about this, is an understanding that it could create such an opportunity for business development in the region. Like, how much we're we're missing in quotes uh, that's going to landfill or or you know not being able to find a productive reuse. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any sense in, in terms of like where some of those opportunities might lie? Um, I guess it depends. I'd have to know more about is, what the project is. Is there a, is um, well? Let me ask you this: Is yeah. there is there a, a an electronic material where you're like you know if we could just 
get our hands on this or there's an opportunity in terms of bringing more more of these products to a productive uh, reuse or eliminate? Is there, is there something out there that you scratch your head about? Well, the things that uh, would, would cause me in my industry to scratch my head would be all the stuff that, that falls out of the household or out of the business environment that gets thrown in the trash. Mm-hmm. Uh, a good example are cell phones. Mm-hmm. Everybody could probably go home and find a drawer full of cell phones. Right. Well, by the time they're in your drawer for two or three years, they lose all their value. Mm -hmm. Now they're just an item that could be shredded, Mm -hmm. and you could recover the materials from them. And there's some valuable rare earths in that phone. So there's there's a lot of missed opportunity, I'd say, when it comes to electronics. Okay. Uh, Statistically, you know, people might tell you that only half of the electronics ever get recycled in the United States. Mm. So if you looked at the opportunity of getting the 60, 70, 80%, then there would be a, a benefit there. That's where the big space is. Mm-hmm. Um, just to maybe finish up here a little bit, Ned, this has been a really great conversation. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, to hit on is your involvement. Uh, you mentioned Sustainable Pittsburgh early on, and you're one of the members of CEOs for responsibility. Correct. Um, or for sustainability, um, right. excuse me. And and maybe tell us a little bit about CEOs and, and how you came to be involved with it. And then uh, some of the things that you guys are working on right now is, uh, as kind of business leaders in the space. Okay. Um, I would say that my involvement with Sustainable Pittsburgh early on, where they had a group of corporations that were involved, mm-hmm. that I followed that group. Uh, we probably met once every several weeks, and it was downtown, and we all got together. And I enjoyed it because I learned so much from the practitioners mm-hmm. at all these companies, people like Allison Robinson at mm-hmm. UPMC, Aurora, yep. um, people from Pitt, Ohio. Um, the, the, the list is endless. People from Eaton Park. These people, uh, Highmark. Phyllis Barber from Highmark. Mm-hmm. I learned so much about what they were studying and what was important to those companies that it made me more apt to be able to fill their needs when it came to doing my job. Mm-hmm. Um, but along the lines, you could see that energy consumption was a big deal. Um, you could see that waste reduction was a big deal. And then as you got exposed to the um, sustainability, UN sustainability goals, mm-hmm. you started seeing a, a platform on which you saw how much improvement needed made all across the spectrum of life. Everything from clean water Mm -hmm. to education to racial equality. So when you look at how you get all of these items on a list and you say, well, what are you going to worry about now? (laughs) Right? That's kind of where it came down to. And the, the CEOs for sustainability today are worried about Three things, and they're they're really trying to push this. One of them is racial and ethnic equality. Mm-hmm. Okay, the other is carbon reduction, but the one that probably means the most is buying local. Mm. You know, when you think about how many people have traditionally not worried about supporting local businesses, right? But now is a time where if we don't support the local businesses, they're not going to be here. Mm-hmm. So I think those three initiatives have been very important in this year. Now, I was one of the the first CEOs in the group. We expanded from probably eight to ten of us. I think we're up to about 60 of us. And once again, every time I meet with those people, I see what's going on at Eaton Corporation. I see what's going on at Covestro. I'm seeing the big players Mm -hmm. in western Pennsylvania, and I'm seeing their pain points. Again, I may not be dealing with all that out in export. But at least I'm being exposed to it, and I can turn or turn around and train my people mm-hmm. to be more attuned to it. And it makes them better citizens. It makes them better employees, and it, and it helps a great deal. That's amazing. The power of networks and sustainability just can't be sold enough. I think it's no, it's I such agree. a great a great lesson and a great opportunity. What's uh, just to to take us home here? What what's next for Eloop? What what do you see? Uh, in in 2021, and you know we've had the challenges of of the pandemic through 2020, uh, with with the the COVID 19 issues, and you know how has that impacted your business? But how are we kind of bouncing forward, and, and what's next for Eloop? Okay, um, 2020 was a year like no other year, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how to say it any differently because we went from gangbusters 
January, February, March to virtually little business mm-hmm. during April and May. Right. And we were able to stay open in, in export because we had several clients that needed us. Mm-hmm. And because we were considered essential, we cut our staff back to 32 hours a week and we stayed on it mm-hmm. all through the year. By the time we got into Labor Day, things started picking up again. And we survived. Mm-hmm. We, we, we really survived very well. And we retained all our employees. That's terrific. Okay, so all the all that we did along that time to help them stay along and keep with us, paid all their health insurance when they when they were laid off for a period of time. We kept everybody current on on everything, and then by the time we got into the fall, you know, everyone was back at, the, at work and happy, and everything was moving forward. And we're still there now. What we've done is we've offer we've actually extended um, offers and and have replaced, or not replaced, added to staff, three different salespeople. Wow. One that focused on the federal government, Mm -hmm. one that focuses on cell phone buyback programs, and one that focuses on our ITAD business. So by expanding our sales force, we think we're going to see some really good organic growth this year. That's terrific. Well, thank you for your leadership, Ned, and and thank you for sharing your story and as well as eLoop's story. Uh, It's a true testament to kind of your leadership as well as kind of the important role that you play uh, in a sustainable business ecosystem here in Pittsburgh. So thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Grant. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for listening to The Dirt uh, and getting all your dirt on sustainability here in southwestern Pennsylvania and across the region. I want to thank our friends uh, from Earth Day Pittsburgh and the Center for Media Innovation here at Point Park University. Uh, and thanks again to Ned Eldridge from eLoop, and good luck to you uh, in these coming months and years. Thanks much. This is Grant Irvin, Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Pittsburgh, and we'll talk to you next time on The Dirt. Take care.